Well, what's going on, guys? How are we? Good. Yeah. Good. It's good to see you guys. Hey, if, uh, if you're a guest or you're checking things out, welcome to LifeBridge. We are really glad that you're here. And I'll just go ahead and speak for everyone else. Uh, make yourself at home today or whenever you're here, all right? So before we get going, though, I actually have a test for all of us today. Um, it's November 24th. How many of you have already put up Christmas decorations? How many of you? Okay. Okay, all right, so great. Christmas decorations, I'm all in. Trees, music, lights, that's great. Some of you are as early as possible. I bet you were singing Jingle Bells as soon as 4th of July was over. That's great. Um, now, here's the other question. How many of you are right, like me, and you wait until after Thanksgiving? How many of you? No, okay, yeah, right, okay. Can we just think, thank you, we can applaud for that. Um, can we just give Thanksgiving a chance, right? Like, I mean, cause seriously, I mean, Mary hasn't even told Joseph that she's pregnant yet. And we got the tree up and we're singing Mariah Carey Christmas already. Like, just let's pump the brakes. Personally, I'm all about, all about Christmas. I can't wait to watch Christmas Vacation and see the tree go up next Friday. Not before, next Friday. I got to tell you this though, um, I really went on a rant on Thursday night uh, about this. And then Friday night when I got home, somebody from the Thursday night service, I, I think I know who, somebody from the Thursday night service came to my house and put up a nine foot tall blow up Frosty the Snowman in my front yard. <laughs> I kid you not. Like, I got a call, I was away and I got a call from Kelly and she was like, did you put up a frosting in the yard? I'm like, no, there's no snow. And she said, no, 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 a blow up frosting. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she sent me a picture. Well played, whoever you were, well played. <laughs> Game on, let's go. <laughs> now, now, even though you're, you're, we, we don't put up Christmas decorations yet, ignore what you see in the lobby, that was not my decision. Um, we can still start thinking about it now. We can, th we can think already because here's what we wanna do. Every single week, Thursday night or Sunday morning, we want to invite more people to come to LifeBridge. We want to have more and more people hear the great news and the hope about Jesus, more and more people be connected and belong. That's every single week here at LifeBridge. But Christmas is one of the best opportunities to invite someone to come with you because on Christmas, almost anyone will accept a personal invitation to come with you. So be intentional about that. Like who is it that you can just start small with? You can have join you and they can come here and experience the hope of Jesus. They can come and experience uh, community for maybe the very first time. Now, Kelly and I, we've been trying to invite people to LifeBridge ever since we got here. And we absolutely will be doing that for Christmas. When you came in here today, there should have been a card on your seat. If you didn't get one, I'll tell you where they're at. A card on your seat. This is just meant to be an intentional tool. It's got the dates and service times for all of our Christmas services. Take this and be intentional with it. Give it to your friend or your neighbor, your barista, coworker, your barber, somebody that would come and join you and experience Christmas with you. Now we're gonna have these every single weekend from now until Christmas. We'll, we won't have them in your seat every week, but they'll be in the lobby or they might be in the seat back in front of you. Take these, use these. Here's my hope. I hope that we run out of cards. I hope that we are so intentional as a church about inviting people to come with us like Christmas that we actually invite more people than we printed cards. That's the challenge, okay? Take, take it or leave it. Take these cards, use them, be intentional with them. Even though you're wrong if you're putting up Christmas decorations now, it's not, early, it's not too early to start inviting people to Christmas now, all right? And hey, if you're a guest or you're checking things out, we're in a series right now where we're walking through the book of Colossians. And last week, we really looked at what our mindset is, is set on because whatever you're thinking about, whatever your mind is locked onto, that's going to determine the direction that you go. So last week, we talked about if my mind is locked onto the realities of heaven, you can hit up the website and see that message. If my mindset is locked onto the realities of heaven, then those realities are going to become tangible in my life. And then on the other side of the coin, if my thinking is all about the things of our world, and there's a whole list of examples of what that is, then those things are going to become tangible in my life also. And this is what can be frustrating for us at times. Sometimes we feel like we get stuck in maybe a, a pattern, or maybe you, you feel like you fall back into something that, that you've wrestled with for years, and it can be really frustrating. Like maybe the pattern that you fall back into is, is one of anger, like anger that you can't control. And it just feels like anger is eating you from the inside. Or maybe the pattern that you're stuck in is, is just talking about people behind their back. 
You play out this imaginary scenario or conversation in your mind about another person and how they're always wrong, how they're always the one to blame. So then that scenario in your head plays out in your life by you talking about them behind their back. Because you want other people to see the same person you see or the one you've created in your mind. Or maybe the pattern for you is is all about getting more stuff or money. And the way that plays out is you just run over people in life because people aren't the priority. Accumulating more and better is. It's greed. Like whatever it is for you, good or bad, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you lock your mind onto will determine the direction you go. So if you want to change your direction, change what you're thinking about. Like let Jesus in. Set your mind and focus on him, and that's where transformation begins. It all starts with our thoughts. But like, Matt, like, do I really need to care about this? I mean, I get it that, that what I'm thinking about can, can affect the direction I'm going or what I'm doing or even the type of person I am. I get it. I get that whatever my mind is locked onto, that can even have powerful consequences. But things are good right now, Matt. Things are, things are good, so, so I probably don't need to worry about this until the problem arises. You know, if, if things are good, that must mean my mind is good. If I run into some trouble or I have a, a rough spot, then, then I'll take that as a sign that I, I might need to look at this. But, but until that happens, man, I'm good to go. And this is where we all need to make a shift. Like what we're really good at, or better yet, I'll say it this way. What we prefer is to have a reactionary default. Whenever there's something that needs a reaction, then I'll react to it accordingly. But until that happens, I'm good to go. We'll just, we'll just stand back. But do you really want to be a reactionary person? Do you just want to say, hey, I'm good to go and, until a problem arises. At that point, I will react accordingly. But until then, I'm just going to hold pat. You want to do that? Because we would all say that being, being proactive is much better. We all strive to be proactive people. We would agree that being a proactive person is a good thing. So let's look at it like this. Instead of reacting to a problem, like what if we were all about responding to a gift? Like what if we made that shift? I mean, the forgiveness, the grace, the new life that that Jesus offers is so good. It's such a good gift. That gift that he offers you deserves a response. I mean, this gift is so good, I want to respond. And, and one of the ways I want to respond, first and foremost, is I want to be like the giver of this gift. Like if you're following Jesus, the reason we focus on Jesus, the reason our mind and our thinking are locked onto him is because we want to be like him. If Jesus is the son of God, if he's your Lord and Savior, then your focus is meant to be locked onto him. And your goal is, can I just take one step today to get a little bit closer to him? Can I take one step today where I might grow in my relationship with him? Can I take one step today where I'm going to look a little bit more like him today? What's my next step? What's my next step? That's a great question to have in front of you every single day. It'll help you take steps towards him instead of away. Because you're never stagnant. Like you're either taking steps toward Jesus or you're taking steps away. That means being proactive. So are you being proactive or indifferent with Jesus? Because if you're being proactive, you'll make progress. If you're indifferent, you'll drift. Are you being proactive or indifferent? And what's your next step? Let me set up a next step for all of us, okay? How good does it feel to put on a brand new shirt? A brand new shirt. Like you go to the store, you get a shirt, you're like, man, I really like the way that looks. I'm going to put it on. Oh, man, my spouse thinks I look good in this. I'm going to wear it for four days straight. Like, it feels good to put on a, good, like a new shirt, right? That's, that's awesome. Put on new jeans, new shoes. Most of us would agree, like, we enjoy putting on new clothes. Well, not me, Matt. I could care less about new clothes. I've been wearing this shirt since 1998, and it's still working for me. Is it working for you? I don't know. Like, there's always somebody that, that, that really needs help updating their wardrobe. And, bro, we can tell that you can care less what your clothes look like. But most of us, we all like putting on new clothes, especially nice new clothes. That's actually the next step is putting on nice new clothes. Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, says this. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and and forgive anyone who offends you. 
Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that came from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill our lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father. So these new threads that we're putting on are compassion and mercy and gentleness and kindness and humility and patience. These, these attributes, if we're comparing them to clothes, that's the analogy that Paul wants to use. And those are nice clothes. I would love it if, if I was thought of as someone that's compassionate and humble and kind and gentle and patient. I, I would love it if when you saw me, you saw me wearing those kind of clothes. But there's days where I put on a shirt and my shirt's anger. That's me. Or maybe I'm wearing some pants that are greed. I can wear a jacket of pride. And some days I, I lace up shoes of impatience. Anybody else wear clothes like that? Yeah, don't act like I'm the only one. Like, Okay. Yeah, because it's a lot easier to wear anger than it is compassion. It's a whole lot easier to put on pride than it is humility. It's a lot easier to be harsh than it is gentle. And this is why you have to be careful. This is why we can't be indifferent. Because if we're indifferent, we will naturally go to our default. And your default is not humility. Sorry to break the bad news to you. It's not. Your default, just like mine, is pride. Your default is not compassion, it's, it's either anger or harshness. Your, your default is not patience, it's impatience. There's no such thing as a naturally humble person. The naturally merciful person, that, that's a myth. Whether we're talking about patience or gentleness or any one of these attributes, none of us naturally put those on, it's not our default. That's why we have to be active in putting on the right clothes. That's why Colossians says, clothe yourselves. Don't assume that it's gonna happen. Don't think it's your default. It's saying don't be passive or indifferent. Actively, every single day, put on these attributes. Why? Because this is what Jesus is wearing. He's wearing compassion. He wears it really, really well. He wears mercy and kindness and gentleness and patience. Man, if that's what he's wearing, that's what I want to wear because I want to be like the giver of the gift that I've received. So I want to wear what he's wearing. We're all prone to wear what other people wear. Like, have you ever noticed, like, how fashion trends start or think about how how fashion starts? It's not like there's a publication that comes out on on December 1st and says, okay, December 1st, everybody's wearing this from now on. It's not how it happens. It it organically happens. Somebody wears something and and it just kind of spreads. And you can follow that for decades. You know, I I wasn't alive in the 70s, but I've seen pictures like some of you know who you are, right? 80s got a little bit better, not much. You know, I kind of really grew up in the late 80s and the 90s, and I thought it was great then, but if I look at pictures of what I was wearing now, whoo, my mom needs to apologize to me for what I wore. Like, it was bad. But it just kind of grows, and it starts somewhere. Somebody wears something, and it spreads. So do you have the same effect on people with your attributes, whatever you're wearing? Do people want to wear what you're wearing? Or who are the people in your life that you look at and you want to wear what they're wearing? I mean, think about it this way. If you've ever watched one of the award shows, um, like the Oscars or Grammys or Emmys, if you ever watch those award shows and you watch the interviews on the red carpet before the show starts, on the red carpet, what's almost always the first question an interviewer will ask a celebrity? What's the first question? Yeah, who are you wearing? Not what are you wearing, who are you wearing? And sometimes they look really good. They, yeah, you look great. And then sometimes you don't want to ask who or what you're wearing. You want to ask, why are you wearing that? <laughs> like, what, why would you design that and why would you wear it? I, I mean, I guess I don't get fashion. Or the NFL right now, it has sideline gear so you can wear what the coaches and the players are wearing. Or if you grew up anywhere close to the time that I grew up, every kid, every kid wanted Jordans. Everybody wanted Jays. Like I desperately wanted the threes. 
I still want those shoes because Michael wore them. And we all know that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time, hands down. It's, there's not even a question. You wear what, you, you wear what people around you are wearing. You wear what, you, what the people you want to be are wearing. Like, I'm already seeing this with my kids. They're getting pretty particular. They're starting to really be cognizant of what they're wearing, depending on who they're looking up to and what their friends are wearing. Because whatever you wear says who you're trying to be like. So go back to that red carpet question. I think it's actually a great question. Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing right now? If you call yourself a Christian, are, are you wearing Jesus or are you wearing somebody else? If this whole church thing is brand new to you, it's a great question to chew on. Who are you wearing? And is it giving you what you thought it would give? Man, I'm going to leave that open-ended and vague on purpose. I want you to chew on it. And keep going with that analogy. By looking at what you're wearing, who would other people say you're trying to be like? Now, we could just leave this at lip service and just say, oh, this is, this is a great little metaphor. Yeah, put on the clothes of compassion, mercy, kindness. That's great. We could put that on a coffee cup and go, go home. But this isn't really applicable. We can't really apply this to our everyday lives. It's, it's easy to think that. But actually, Colossians gives three really easy handles of how we make this happen. Here's number one. It says, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Huh. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. But I don't want to. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to forgive this person that, that did this thing to me. I don't want to forgive the person that offends me on a regular basis. They're not even asking for forgiveness. I didn't do what they did. I didn't say what the thing that they said, so why should I forgive them? And sometimes giving forgiveness is hard. When someone hurts you, or they offend you, or they betray you, and giving forgiveness can be hard, but it's required. Because you cannot put on compassion or mercy or gentleness or kindness or humility or patience. You can't put those things on if you're not willing to forgive somebody. Holding back forgiveness, it breeds bitterness. Have you ever met somebody that's just, they're just bitter? They're just a bitter person. Were they compassionate? Or kind or gentle or patient? No. Because those things in bitterness, they, they can't coexist. They, they can't. But here's the good news. Forgiveness is the antidote to bitterness. And, and I don't want to say that lightly. I don't want to say that lightly because in some cases, it's a whole lot easier to forgive than it is in others. Like if somebody just loses their cool and, and they, they say something to you that's a little harsh, but then they almost immediately ask for forgiveness, that's a lot easier to forgive that person than it is the other one that's wounded you in such a deep way in whatever way imaginable. And I know that's in this room right now. Like some of you have been hurt or offended or wounded or betrayed in such a God awful way that when you hear me say forgive someone, maybe that even makes you mad that I would say that. I get it, I totally get it. Why should I forgive them? They don't deserve it. They're the one that caused all the pain. They're the one that, that caused all the destruction. Why should I forgive them? They, they don't deserve it. And I get it. I totally get it. But when you're in that spot, we have to realize, and this is where it'll start to help. It doesn't mean it's easy, but this is where it'll start to help. We got to realize that we didn't deserve forgiveness from Jesus, but he gave it to us anyway. And not only does holding back forgiveness breed bitterness, but it actually robs you of freedom. It robs you of your own freedom, and it also doesn't allow you to heal. If I'm holding back forgiveness from someone, if I'm holding it back, then it's so easy for me to replay whatever happened or whatever was said in my mind. And maybe I replay that on a daily basis, that thing that would happen or, or that thing that was said and, and I lash out in my mind against that person or, or maybe I fantasize about things going wrong for them. If that's the case, then I'm reliving it every day. I've never left it. I become prisoner to the thing that happened to me or the thing that was said to me. 
But by letting go of it, by forgiving and letting go of it, you free not the other person, you actually free yourself. Now, when somebody says, don't ever say, don't ever flippantly say to other people, hey, just forgive and forget. Don't be flippant with that. Absolutely, we want to forgive. But forgetting's hard. It's really hard. It doesn't, there's some stuff you won't ever forget. I've got scars. I'm pointing here because I've got one right here. I've got scars all over my body from years of sports and different things. I got scars. I can still see those wounds. I can't feel them anymore, though. I can see them. By forgiving, I can let my wounds turn into scars. I'll still be able to see them, but I won't feel them. But if I'm holding forgiveness back, those open wounds, they stay open wounds. I'll never be able to heal. Holding back forgiveness, it's like you, it's like you drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. That's what it's like. It's self-inflicted harm. Like be free. Let yourself heal by forgiving whoever it is that you need to forgive. And I know I'm not, I'm not saying that lightly. I know for some, some of you, that's a really, really big ask. Be like Jesus. Forgive like Jesus. And because you've been forgiven, we're expected to forgive. Also expect to be wronged. Expect to be offended, either unintentionally or intentionally. Doesn't make it okay. Doesn't mean it won't hurt. But make allowances. That's what Colossians says. Build in margins of grace and forgiveness so that you can give it out before people even need it. That's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. He built in allowances for our sin, our errors, and the way we would offend him. He built in forgiveness and mercy and grace before we ever even took breath. That's how he was able to go to the cross freely. He knew it was coming. That's how he could even say at the very end, some of his very last words on the cross, he says, Father, what? Father, forgive them. Because I don't, I don't understand that. Like, why would you do that? Like, you're, you're being executed. You're an innocent man. And the people that are executing you are mocking you while you're dying. Why would you spend some of your very last breath saying, forgive them? They don't deserve it. I'm an innocent man. They're killing me. They're mocking me. Why would I forgive them? But Jesus does. Why would you spend your last breath saying that? Because Jesus knew how powerful it was for you and for me, for them. He also knew how powerful it was for him. He needed to do it too. You cannot put on the clothes that Colossians is talking about. You can't put them on unless you're willing to forgive. Number two, you can't forgive unless you're willing to love. It says this, above all, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Why did Jesus forgive you? Because he loves you. That's it. It's that simple. I, I don't have anything else to say. There's not some deep theological breakdown of that. Jesus' forgiveness for you was driven by his love for you. It's that it. It's that simple. Because whenever you love someone, you're willing to do whatever for them. Sounds like the beginning of a Brian Adams song, doesn't it? Whenever you love someone, you want to put them ahead so that they thrive. Whenever you love someone or other people, you're willing to forgive them. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but you're willing to forgive them. Whenever you put on love first, wearing compassion and kindness and mercy and gentleness and humility and patience, it makes wearing those things so much easier and they look so much better. You'll be able to love someone and other people when you realize how much you are loved. It's going to take you all of eternity to understand and realize how much Jesus actually loves you. But my hope and my prayer and vision for this place is you find out right here first. You start learning about it here. How much you're actually loved. That will drive you to love other people. And then here's number three. It says, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Always be thankful. Let the message about Christ, that's God's word, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom that he gives. So if you want to put on what Jesus is wearing, you got to know Jesus. I mean, you can know stuff about Jesus, just like you can know stuff about Abraham Lincoln, but you can't personally know him unless you're in his word. So the Bible is not a book of rules. It's not what this is. 
Man, it it talks about conduct and the way we live our lives, absolutely. But the purpose of this is not rules. This is not the roadmap to your life, if you've ever heard it described that way. The intentions behind that aren't bad, but this is not the roadmap for your life. If it was, that, that means it's about you. It's not a map. Like, even though there's maps in the back, it's not a map. It was a little funny. I, mean, I, I could have delivered that better. <laughs> this is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadows and points to Jesus. Everything in the New Testament is about what he did and how that changes everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. That includes your life and my life. It's a story. And the more we know this story, the more we personally know him. It's how we're transformed too. Hebrews 4.12 says this. This is a classic verse if you've ever heard this. It says, for the word of God is living and active. It's not some textbook. It's not something written on a stone somewhere. It's living and active. It's alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That gets in there. So the Bible will change you if you let it, if you let it. And I know at times it can be overwhelming or even intimidating. Like, man, like, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what it means. I don't understand it. I don't even know where to start. Totally get it. You're not alone. Or maybe you come at it from another angle like, hey, I'm going to conquer the Bible. I'm going to master it. Both of those approaches are wrong. Don't ever come at it like it's something to be conquered. And also don't be apprehensive either. But instead, here's how we approach the Bible. Slowly, slowly. Read it slowly so that it reads you. That's the point of reading the Bible, is to let it read you. I never want to approach this like this is something I'm going to master or conquer. I want it to conquer me. Because that's where growth happens. That's where my own personal transformation happens, is when I let this read me. That was happening this morning. Man, I'm, I'm working through First John in my own personal quiet time right now. Whew. It was reading me this morning. That's where growth comes. Here's my, here's my prayer. Every time I get into God's word, here's my very profound prayer to start off. God, will you just help me understand what I'm reading and speak to me? That's it. Every time. A couple years ago, I got the chance to meet a, a really well-known British pastor who's in his mid-80s now. And um, man, it was just that guy, he's been a part of some incredible movements in the church He's experienced more in his lifetime than three other people put together. He's a walking billboard for these clothes in Colossians 3. In fact, we could, we could have him be a runway model for these. And so we were talking, and, and um, it's just really apparent really quickly, this guy knows Jesus. Have you ever been around someone like that? That as soon as you're around them, you just realize, wow, they know Jesus. They've been around him because he or she wears these clothes so well. Have you ever met somebody like that? Man, I bet you that if you go and ask the people that you know or or, or meet, the people that are the most compassionate, they're gentle, they're kind, they're humble, they're thankful, they're loving, those people that, that, that just, that stuff manifests in them better than anybody else, I bet you, I bet you they know and love Jesus. I mean, that's what I want to be like. I want to look like that. I'm, I'm not there yet. But my hope is that in, when people leave spending time with me, that they would, they would think, man knows Jesus. Not knows stuff about Jesus, but he knows him and he's been with him. I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. So with that in mind, I asked him, okay, Stuart, if you could give me one piece of advice, what would it be? And without hesitation, I mean, he didn't even blink. He said, get in the word so the word gets in you. And that's so simple. But oftentimes, the most profound and impactful advice is the simplest. So I just want to pass that on to you. Get in the Word so the Word gets in you. Just start somewhere. Just take a step. Because when the Word gets in you, it will transform you. When the Word gets in you, you will naturally love people more and more. When the word gets in you, it becomes a little bit easier to forgive people and it becomes a personal blessing. When the word gets in you, you have no other option than to clothe yourselves with compassion and gentleness and kindness and patience and humility. Get in the word so the word gets in you. And when the word gets in you, love, forgiveness, and really, really nice clothes are the product of it. 
So this pastor finished off our conversation with this. He just said, hey, um, I just want to represent Jesus well. I was like, man, you have and you still are. He was praying Colossians 3.17 and he modeled it. And whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. That's our why. So if you're a Christian, if that's what you call yourself, if you're following Christ, everything you do, everything you say is meant to represent Jesus well. As a church, LifeBridge, everything we do, everything we say is meant to represent Jesus. Everything we do around here has a purpose, has an intention, and it's always to represent Jesus well. Some days we don't do it well, some days we will. As an individual, some days you'll do it well, some days you won't. I don't represent Jesus well every day. More often than not, I don't represent him well. And I just want to make a, take a step closer today. Can I make a little bit of progress today? Can I rep him better today than I did yesterday? And then maybe tomorrow I can rep him better then than I am today. And it starts with what clothes I'm putting on. It's a choice. You get to pick. What clothes do you want to wear? Here's the really cool thing. When you wear clothes over and over again, they tend to get worn out, right? The more you wear them, the more they wear out. But the opposite is true with these. The more you put on compassion and mercy and love and thankfulness and gentleness and kindness and humility and patience, the more you put those on, they actually get nicer. They don't wear out. They look better on you. They smell better. They fit better. They keep getting better the more you put them on. But it's up to you. You got to pick. You got to be proactive. You can't be indifferent. So today, what do you want to wear? Who do you want to wear? What do you want to wear tomorrow? And what do you want to wear the day after that? And every day after that, it's a choice. Because what you wear says who you're trying to be like. Who are you trying to be like? Are you trying to be like Jesus? Or are you trying to be like somebody else? Who are you wearing? Let me pray for us. God, we give you praise and honor and glory. And we're here to worship you because you're such a great God. And Jesus, you've worn these clothes, these attributes so well. You've been such a model for us but it's really hard for us to put them on. Some days it's easier than others, but I pray right now that you would give us grace and courage to put them on every single day, that we would choose to wear what you're wearing, that we would choose to wear you every day. So the more people encounter you tangibly when they encounter us. Father, I pray no matter where anybody is right now, whether they're, they don't know you and this whole church thing is brand new or they've been walking with you for decades, that you'd stir our hearts, each individual. You'd help us take a step closer to you, whatever that step is for us today. We love you. We want to bring you praise. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.